So this talk will be about count time series actually, and we'll, we'll speak about mixing properties in these uh, time series, non-stationary as well as stationary settings. And this is joint work with uh, Paul Dukan and Michael Neumann. So throughout the talk, I will follow the outline that you see here. I will briefly motivate the topic, also explain which kind of uh, count time series we are looking at. These are these so-called in-gauge models. And then I will tell you a little bit about how to show absolute regularity or beta mixing for these kind of uh, count processes. And there's also a latent process, I call it lambda here, I will explain it later in detail. And here we cannot show uh, absolute regularity, but we show ergodicity in some uh, cases. And uh, then we go to some examples to see how the theory can be applied and actually uh, this talk is, uh, in a sense, full of compromises um, because if you want to have a nice general result, then you often end up with high-level assumptions. And here we want to balance things a little bit and you will see the outcome in the example. So sometimes this balancing works out nicely, sometimes well. Um, one has to do some additional work. And if I have time in the end, I will have a very short application. So these count data are all over, so I mean, uh, actually, this work was done during the pandemic, so we were also uh, looking at these daily uh, COVID infection numbers, um, 2020, um, but also in other contexts. So also migration is a topic right now. So you see uh, 25 years uh, migration and uh, numbers here in the Netherlands. And in any cases, you see there is a trend and uh, there's also a periodic pattern. So uh, there's a lot of non-stationarity in the data. And um, however, my feeling is that, especially for this count uh, time series, um, there's much less literature on the non-stationary settings than um, in, the, in the stationary uh, framework. And so we want to go a little bit into this direction, showing absolute regularity for these so-called integer-valued uh, gauge processes. And um, I'm not sure whether all of you know these processes, and therefore here's a brief introduction, starting actually by classical uh, gauge processes. So let's see whether I'm able to use it. Yes, so we have this Y here. And Y is a, a multiplicative uh, process uh, containing a, a noise, epsilon, and sigma t, which is called the conditional uh, uh, variance, or sigma squared is called the conditional uh, variance which has this uh, linear uh, representation in the squared process uh, and also the squared uh, previous variances. And then you have this conditional heteroscedicity that you see in this blue line here. So the conditional variance of your observation today, given the past uh, observations and the past uh, variances, is just a sigma t squared. So this is uh, why it gets its name from. So now if we come to the count uh, time, uh, or the count data, um, then we have no longer this uh, multiplicative structure of our process Y, because I mean, multiplication is uh, horrible if you want to have count data. Yeah? Um, but what you have is also some kind of latent process, which we now call lambda, which is in this case the intensity uh, of a Poisson uh, distribution, so yt, given the past of the observations and also the past intensities, is assumed to follow a Poisson distribution with this random intensity lambda. And this intensity lambda now follows the same model equation uh, as you see above for the sigma squared, but not in the squared processes now. And again, um, this process inherits this conditional heteroscedicity. So the conditional variance of yt given the past uh, is lambda t and due to the Poisson distribution, um, this is the same as the conditional mean. So you have a little bit more. Um, and in this talk, we will focus on Poisson in gauge models. I mean, you could also think of other uh, distributions uh, rather than Poisson. Okay. Um, so what we will do here is we will only have a look at in-gauge 1, 1 models. So only one uh, latent uh, variable and also one lagged observation in this hidden intensity function. And, but, but, maybe but, we allow for a flexible class of functions. So not only linear functions, but you see we have these uh, functions Ft, you know, I do like this. Um, we have this function Ft up here. Um, which depends on the lagged one observation, the lagged one intensity, and we also allow for uh, exogenous covariance. 
Um, and then uh, now the sigma algebra Fs also contains these uh, lect covariances. Um, and F can be quite flexible, so you see it also depends on time, so this is where we go for non-stationarity later on. Um, but we are a bit restrictive um, regarding the covariates in the following sense. So we assume that these CTs are independent of uh, the lagged um, process Y, lambda, and Z, and also that CT is, orthogonal, uh, sorry, is independent to YT. Um, but we do not assume stationarity. So, um, so think of these uh, examples that I showed you in the beginning where we had this trend. So we could think of CT being just a deterministic uh, trend. Um, and then this, if we want to incorporate things like this, this would uh, not go with the stationarity assumption. So here we want to be uh, a bit more uh, flexible. Um, and actually what we will show is uh, absolute regularity of this joint process of the counts and the covariates um, under rather general assumptions on F. Um, and this now then opens the door to apply, I mean, the theory, the nice theory, especially the French community developed for mixing processes, not only under stationarity, but also under non-stationarity. So maybe thinking of the central limit theorem of Rio to have just one French uh, reference here. Um, coming to references, um, there is quite some literature about stationary count time series and uh, all the mixing properties, and I cannot give a full review here, but um, I think the first uh, paper is by Michael Neumann in 2011, uh, where he considered in-gauge 1-1 models, stationary situation, and then generalized things to in-gauge PQ models. And there's a related paper by Knusch and Frank. Um, and the main assumption is that this function f, in their case not dependent on time, is, uh, satisfies a kind of contractive condition to get things work. Um, so f is a function of the elect observation, the elect intensities, and this is assumed to satisfy this kind of Lipschitz condition, where all these constants ci and dj sum up to a constant which is less than one. Um, and then they show that yt is absolutely regular, with an exponential decay of mixing. And then there, oh sorry, sorry uh, I should mention that lambda t in general is not mixing. There's a counterexample, a very, uh, very easy one, a linear case by, by Michael showing that you cannot uh, expect mixing for this intensity process, um, but you get ergodicity under certain uh, regularity condition. And so we cannot expect it in our more general framework as well. Um, then there is related work, again, by uh, Paul Dukan and Michael Neumann in 2019, where they relax this uh, contractive condition above, uh, only assuming that you have this contraction with respect to lambda, uniformly in device. And this is, uh, can be done on the price of the decay of the mixing coefficients, so then you only have sub-exponential. And then there's uh, many other work on these count uh, time series in, in the stationary setup, so not only absolute regularity, but also other kinds of uh, weak dependence, like torque dependence, have been uh, discussed. So, but here we will focus now on uh, beta mixing and we'll generalize these things um, for more flexible functions phi, f, uh, f and allowing for covariates. Um, okay. So this is now the main part of the talk, uh, absolute regularity of x. Um, and actually, what, I, what my plan is, is to give you an intuition of the proof somehow, um, because otherwise it's just one theorem. And I think it is important to understand a little bit how things work, because uh, you cannot only uh, apply this theorem in these examples later on. As I say, we have to do some compromises here to find nice conditions, to have a nice theorem on the one hand side, um, but this is uh, on the cost or on the price of some flexibility. So recall the model again, so yt given uh, this uh, sigma, algebra, sorry, sigma algebra of the past is Poisson with this intensity function lambda. And now um, recall again, x is the joint process of the counts and the covariates. This is the guy that we want to consider now. Um, and due to this model equation, the joint process lambda and x is Markovian, however, x alone is not Markovian. Um, and then we come up, or we can define the mixing coefficient, and now we have to be a little bit careful because we are in a non-stationary setup. So our present state is state k or time point k, and then the time lag is denoted by n. Yeah, so uh, we want to have this guy small with respect to n later on. So we consider the 
mixing coefficient of the sigma algebra of the past, going from x0 to xk, and then yes, like n, and then you consider the future. And then you can uh, upper bound this quantity by substituting this first sigma algebra by fk, which is a richer uh, sigma algebra, also containing lambdas, uh, sorry, uh, oh yeah, also containing the lambdas. And then you are in the point to, at this point, you can use this Markovian structure going back from this uh, rich sigma algebra fk to the sigma algebra, um, which is generated by a lambda k plus one. Um, so basically what we have to consider is this quantity in the last line, um, this expectation uh, of the uh, max or the total variation uh, distance between this measure of the future behavior of the process given lambda k plus one with respect to, uh, compared to the unconditional distribution. And the main ingredients will now be coupling arguments. We will not use the bare Bay coupling, saying that beta mixing can be represented as the probability of uh, these random variables to be uh, different from each other, but we will do some different kind of coupling in such a way that we can really use the model structure, the structure of F, um, to then really show that these uh, coupling arguments can be used in application. So here's what we do. We always assume that there is uh, probability space, which is rich enough, getting now tildes. Um, however, I will not pronounce the tildes, but I will write them all, all the time. And we assume that we have two versions of our original process, uh, lambda and x, without prime and with prime. And for these guys, we start um, to generate these processes independently, such that up to time k or lambda k plus one and lambda k plus one prime are independent. So this is far away from coupling it so far. But this allows us uh, using some calculation that we have an upper bound of our beta mixing coefficient um, by the probability of x k n plus r being different from the corresponding prime variable for some future time point, so for some r in, in uh, n naught. And this quantity we can rewrite as you see it in the last line, so either at this very beginning, so after time lag n, these quantities are different, so this is a red term, or the process evol uh, evolves equally, and then just at time point k plus n plus r, these guys are different from each other. And the idea is now to consider the blue and the red quantity separately, and use uh, some really nice, uh, really coupling arguments. So now we have to bring things together to get a bound for the blue and the red term. And what we do is actually a very strong coupling. Actually, it's the same as uh, Leonel, Paul, and uh, Michael used in, in their paper on stationarity for these kind of processes. Um, so we assume that we can choose or we construct the coupling in such a way that these C's with and without prime are just identical. And this is, uh, can be done since C is independent of, of the past. So um, also we start these processes independently. Um, we can, uh, from a future time point onwards, we can uh, build the coupling in such a way that these quantities um, are just equal with uh, probability one, so very strong coupling. And for the count uh, data, we use a so-called maximal coupling. Um, where we construct uh, our count data according to the model equation. So um, we use this Poisson uh, law here with respect to the previous lambda, once with prime and one without prime. But the sigma algebra, which is now in the background, this f also gets a prime with brackets because this is now jointly uh, <coughs> based on the process with and without prime. And then you can uh, do it in such a way that this probability of these quantities to be different, so the count uh, quantities, given this uh, previous uh, evaluation of the process, is just the total variation distance of the Poisson uh, distributions with these different lambdas. Um, and since these Cs are equivalent with probability one, this immediately applies that also the probability of the axis being different, given the past, is the distance uh, or the total variation distance of these Poisson distributions with the lambdas with or without prime. Um, <clears throat> so this means to get the right, uh, the red quantity um, somehow under control, we have to consider this expectation you see in the last line. 
And this we do as follows. We have an, we have an assumption that I will uh, comment on later on. So assume that you can bound this total variations distance of the measures of these different lamnas by just the distance between lamnas for, for, any kind of, for some kind of distance. And there are these distances, but I will uh, speak about this a little later. Um, then we can find an upper bound of the red term, probability of xk with, with and without prime being different from each other, by just taking the expectation of the lambdas with and without prime. Um, so for the blue term, uh, we have to be a little bit more careful get, to get a similar bound, because we, what we have is that the process evolves uh, equally at the, with and without prime up to a certain time point, and then uh, we have a certain change. Um, and to control this thing, actually, we will use some kind of contraction condition. What you see is uh, assumption A1 here, where you assume that you have this contraction condition um, with respect to lambda. So the expectation of the distance of these uh, fun intensity functions Ft can be bounded by constant L1, which is less than 1, times the distance of the lambdas. And you see, we have the same lambda here on the left and on the right-hand side. This is due to the fact that we start with a situation where x and x prime are just uh, the same. And when we can use this uh, in an inductive way to obtain uh, the bound that you see uh, in the last line. So you have no problem with this uh, infinite sum. And all that we have to do now is to... Um, control the expectation of the difference of the lambdas. So things are easier at, at that point if we understand how the lambdas evolve. Um, yes, and we have a quite explicit bound for beta then. So let's see how, how this, uh, this expectation can be tackled, actually. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, we need some kind of bound, depending only on the lag n, hopefully in an exponential way. And recall that we started this coupling with independent lambdas. So um, we need some, some kind of uh, coupling now which can be, or which works, if the corresponding lambda k plus 1 and lambda k plus 1 prime are independent of each other. And here again, you see a contraction condition. So <clears throat> if we uh, have uh, this, or have a look at this quantity here, so now you have uh, different. Uh, y's here, one with prime and without, um, and the same for lambda and c, and we want this quantity to be bounded by a constant, again, less than one times the distance of the lambdas only. Um, and maybe you're wondering where the y's are gone now, um, but this is due to the expectation and the, the idea that the expectation of the Poisson is just the intensity. So somehow hidden that you also have this kind of contraction of the function f with respect to uh, y. Um, and then if you just use this um, blue term that you see in assumption 2, uh, iteratively, you can trace back the expectation of the distance between these lambdas at time point k, point k plus n back to k plus, time point k plus 1. So you have now um, jumped over the lag, and you really see that this constant L2 here is to the power uh, n minus uh, 1, so you have the exponential decay of the beta mixing coefficient as long as you get now finally this uh, expectation of the lambdas um, at, this at this stage k plus 1 uh, under control. So and this is the part where these guys are really independent of each other. So now if you're in the stationary case, <clears throat> then this would be quite easy. I mean, you assume that you have a nice uh, distance and you have some uniform bound of moments of, of these lambdas and then you are done. <coughs> but we also intend to capture this explosive behavior of lambda, so think of this explosive trend. So in general, we do not want to assume lambda k to be stochastically bounded. But still, we have to be assumed that it is not too wild in the sense. Um, and again, here we can use the coupling. So now recall lambda k plus 1 and lambda k plus 1 prime are independent. Now if we succeed in finding a coupling um, of our processes uh, in such a way that again we have some kind of contraction condition that you see in condition number 2 here. Um, that one. So the distance between the lambda t's at a future time bond can be traced back to the distance uh, of the lambdas at time t times a contracting con constant, L3 less than 1, 
plus some other constant. And for the initial lambdas, you only need that this expectation is bounded. Um, and then if you combine these things, you also get a bound for the distance uh, of the lambdas at stage k without assuming that the lambda k's are bounded themselves. Um, and in doing all, putting all these things together, we find a bound for the beta mixing coefficient, as you see here. So um, the left, sorry, the right hand side is very explicit. So you find all these constants again uh, in this bound, and you see the exponential decay. As I said, for the lambdas, we cannot assume uh, mixing or we cannot expect mixing. However, if we are in a stationary setup, then we can argue in a similar way as uh, Reinhardt did just before. We can show that lambda can be written as a function of the axis of all previous axes. So the axis are beta mixing, which implies their ergodicity, and then also the joint process can be shown to be ergodicity, ergodic under this stationarity assumption. Okay, so this is the theorem. Let's see how we can uh, apply it. But before I should mention uh, a few or say a few words about this distance. So I just claim that there is a distance. Uh, which can be used to bound the total variations of these two Poisson distributions. And actually, in the literature, we find uh, two very explicit examples. The first is just the L1 uh, distance between these guys, or you take uh, the distance between the corresponding square root quantities. This also uh, works. Um, and we will see both uh, of these uh, metrics or distances in a, in a minute in these examples. So the first example is um, going back to this linear in gauge one run process uh, situation. Now we allow this coefficients a and b also depend on time, um, as long as they sum up to a constant which can uniformly be bounded uh, by a constant L2, we call it here, which is less than one. This is assures uh, to these contraction conditions to hold. So really, you see, we have contraction condition with respect to both uh, uh, constants A and B, um, which was somehow hidden in these uh, assumptions that we saw before. Um, then we need also the, uh, the covariates to behave nicely. So we want to have a Poisson distribution. Lambda should be uh, greater than zero. So we assume these guys to be uh, non-negative. and also bounded, so this is a non-explosive case in this example, regarding the Cs, and then we get, uh, by just applying the theorem, this beta mixing coefficient, one really can show by just using the ordinary additive coupling for Poisson uh, distribution that all these kind of uh, contraction conditions are satisfied. So this is, um, once you have this uh, result this theorem, this is not uh, hard work to do, just using this uh, classical uh, L1 distance. And also this can be then easily generalized to just also having a nonlinear link function on top of that. So uh, there are <coughs> functions, so for instance, these in -gauge, soft plus in -gauge processes by Christian Weiss, Zhu and Yoshiara um, is such a case where they wanted to have a some kind of link function which is close to the ReLU function that the machine learning community uh, uses quite a lot, but the zero is, uh, is uh, very complicated because uh, Poisson with, with intensity zero makes no sense. So they have a smooth version which is also uh, positive everywhere and close to this uh, ReLU function and that this can be, for instance, uh, also covered. So now what about the explosive case? Um, so I started with saying, okay, let CT be also be a deterministic trend. Um, and here you see the conditions for the explosive case, and all you see in red is, uh, are the things that changed in comparison to the previous uh, theorem. Um, and I think the, the important point to look at is, is uh, part number two. Um, here you have now, before here was the expectation of CT, and now we compare square root of CT and its expectation. So if ZT is just a deterministic, deterministic trend, um, ZT explodes. However, this quantity is just zero, so, uh, bounded, uh, so in this condition is satisfied. Again, we get absolute regularity. Um, here we do not have such a nice uh, representation. Still, we have this exponential decay. Um, and the problem with this example is that the choice of the metric is, is not straightforward. Um, and we have to balance somehow between both uh, metrics so we can uh, mimic the proof uh, once with this uh, L1 distance, one with the distance of the square root term. Um, for the large uh, lambdas, we take the square root. 
with the smaller lambdas, we take the ordinary metric, and then we have to balance these things, choose M appropriately, and so on and so forth, and then we get this result. And the reason uh, to do is um, to maybe just have a look at this rather easy example of an inarch uh, model, so it should be just um, a linear trend here, and um, one can show that in this uh, explosive case, although the expectation of the diff distance of these two lambdas uh, will blow up, will increase to infinity, which would contradict our assumption A3, where we need a uniform bound of the distance of these lambdas. If we use, however, this square root transformation, it is known to be a variance uh, stabilizing in this uh, Poisson models, and then we get rid of this. However, on the other hand, it is ugly to work with this square root uh, metric if you want to use this contraction condition in, in these uh, linear processes. And so you have to balance uh, things. And this is what I started with uh, saying, speaking about compromises. So you cannot apply this theorem directly, but the kind of uh, ideas you use, uh, you, can be, you can adapt them to, uh, to also consider these kind of explosive ingotch uh, models. And finally, maybe um, also work, people working in, in these count data know the log linear process uh, introduced by Costas and Dr. Jostheim in 2011. Um, this can also be handled with similar arguments. Again, the proof has to be adapted. We also show that uh, we can adapt the situation to other distributions um, if we have some ad additional regressor um, multiplied with this function f. Which, now, which then results in zero inflated Poisson or Neckbin distributions. Um, so in that sense, the results are quite flexible. But one has to be a little bit careful. Maybe you really have to go into the proof and therefore I just wanted to motivate how you do these kind of coupling things. So what is time? Uh, maybe I, I just start with this. Uh, oh, yeah, that's just, um, it's a very, very brief application, uh, <laughs> a very uh, small example where we were just, uh, we were speaking about this uh, trend behavior so much in this talk. So um, <clears throat> in this example, let's consider an in-arch model. So with only lambdas, I just could not manage it. So the lambda here depends on the elect uh, count variable plus maybe an isotonic trend CT, but not on the elect observation because this is always hard uh, for, for estimation and we really want to have a small uh, yeah, illustration here. And then the null hypothesis would be that all the expectations of the Ys are constant over time against the alternative that we have uh, a decrease, uh, sorry, an isotonic trend under the alternative. And the idea for the test statistic is somehow to do some orthogonal uh, regression, um, <clears throat> writing yt, as you can see it here, in, a, in a, such a linearized way, where obviously the epsilons are then non-stationary, um, but which allows for to estimate this uh, parameter theta hat as a theta one, which indicates whether there's a trend or not in a very easy way, as you see it down here, just using this weight multiplied uh, by y doing ordinary least squares regression. And I mean, also if the trend is not uh, linear itself, then still the projection uh, <coughs> should have some positive value. So under the null, um, the expectation of this quantity you see down here, so the estimator theta, hen, theta hat one should be zero, while under the alternative it should be positive if we have an increasing trend. And actually we proved things um, for the special case of uh, this linear in arch model with a deterministic trend here. And so the, under the null hypothesis, so B equal to C uh, to zero, we get asymptotic normality. And actually, um, I mean, this could be proven without our new results because uh, then you are in the stationary setup. So the point where we used our results is, uh, is the alternative, showing that this guy explodes under the alternative. I mean, it's not, it's not hard to show that the expectation of data head uh, goes <coughs> to infinity if, if this uh, trend, uh, if we have this monotone trend here, but to control for the variance, this is somehow uh, the hard part to do. And here we could use uh, covariance inequalities that hold under mixing, not only under stationarity, um, to tackle uh, this point and to also show um, consistency of this test. And so I come back to COVID. Uh, so this is 2020 and I hope 
we have something different uh, this year. So um, in, the in the top line, you see the, the cases of infections or the infection numbers in France and in Germany. And on the bottom line, you see the um, death numbers. And the test clearly rejects uh, for uh, the null hypothesis for having no trend for the first line and also for the French data regarding the death in 2020 in this two month time period, but not for uh, Germany. So there I wrote the p values uh, for, for the others, it's the p values is essentially zero. Um, so to just have a previous conclusion. So um, I hope that I convinced you that we can show absolute regularity for a broad class of count time series. We do not need to focus on, sta on stationary time series um, and also not on linear processes only. We can allow for trends, explosive behavior. Sometimes, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, there's also, rest. I just mentioned uh, uh, some literature maybe in the end. There's related work in the stationary setup, also for more general, so for Ingarge PQ models uh, by uh, Dukan, Kahn, and Neumann, 2021. That's it, I will stop here. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>